Hello, and welcome to my series on the CT of thoracoabdominal emergencies. I'm Dr. Benjamin Strong, the Chief Medical Officer of Virtual Radiologic, or VRAD. I started my career with an internal medicine residency and followed that with three years of work as an emergency physician. I then returned to training for a radiology residency and a fellowship in body and MSK MRI. In the course of my over 20 years in radiology, I have worked as a private practice radiologist, an academic radiologist, and for the last 17 years as a teleradiologist for VRAD. I have been the chief medical officer there for eight years and am licensed to practice in all 50 states. Here is our agenda for this series, which I have broken into nine sessions of eight cases each, all grouped by organ system. Session nine. Well, session nine turns out to be a bit of a grab bag with all those cases that didn't group properly into larger organ systems. So as you can see, we run the gamut here from pancreatitis to a number of infectious uh, presentations. So we'll begin with a case of emphysematous pancreatitis. This may very well be the worst case of emphysematous pancreatitis I've ever seen. Uh, the one feature of it I thought I might highlight is the fact that the pancreatic duct is entirely filled throughout its length with gas. Pretty impressive, and you'll see a contained collection of fluid and gas really throughout the entirety of the retroperitoneum. So here is the cine. You can see already the gas in the retroperitoneum. It's all confined there, and there is the pancreatic duct, gas filled throughout its course. And this again is one you're unlikely to see uh, of this extent, and of course this patient unfortunately did not survive. So that is a case of emphysematous pancreatitis. Our next case is a hemorrhagic pancreatitis. Here is the source of the hemorrhage. It's actually a gastric vessel, most likely the gastroepiploic. It has been eroded by an adjacent inflammatory phlegmon right there adjacent to the gastric fundus. The entirety of the pancreas is swollen, edematous, hypodense, and extending into it, you'll see, is some of the hemorrhage originating from that gastroepiploic vessel. Lastly, you can see the phlegmonous inflammation of the pancreas is actually extended into the hilum of the spleen and is eroding it a clear second risk for extensive hemorrhage. So here on the cine, you can see that fundal phlegmon eroding into a vessel and the hemorrhage resulting from that actually pouring down into the pancreatic parenchyma. And lastly, that splenic hilar erosion most likely to cause problems uh, in the near future. There again is a phlegmon adjacent to the gastric fundus, resultant hemorrhage, and splenic erosion. So a severe case of pancreatitis resulting in arterial hemorrhage. Our next case is also a hemorrhagic pancreatitis but this is an acute hemorrhagic event superimposed on chronic pancreatitis. You can see a small collection of contrast here within a larger hyperdense fluid collection, and that's the origin of this hemorrhage, most likely coming from the left gastric artery in this case. Lower down, you can appreciate the hyperdense fluid within the pancreatic parenchyma, as well as extensive pancreatic calcifications. Lower down, you can see those calcifications very densely packed here in the pancreatic head. On the cine, there you can appreciate the small pseudoaneurysm, again, probably from the left gastric artery, the extensive hyperdense fluid collection, and of course, the dense calcifications representing chronic pancreatitis. So that's an acute hemorrhagic pancreatitis 
superimposed on chronic pancreatitis. Our next case is a corneal ectopic, a very important finding to make. Obviously, ectopics in general are dangerous, but those in the cornua have a real tendency to cause acute hemorrhage and poor outcomes. So here you can see the gestational sac in the right uterine cornua. Note the lack of a myometrial rim around the entirety of that gestational sac, which allows the diagnosis of a corneal ectopic. Obviously, there is intraperitoneal extravasation here, a focus of actual contrast extravasation, but extensive heterogeneous and hyperdense fluid throughout the peritoneum. There is that contrast extravasation and the gestational sac. Again, note the lack of a myometrial rim surrounding it. Let's look at that on the coronal as well. Here you can really appreciate the corneal location of that gestational sac. And there is a little bit of the active extravasation you can really appreciate throughout the abdomen there. As that extravasation wends its way through the intraperitoneal clot, it looks almost like a vessel. And that's a fairly common appearance of ongoing intraperitoneal hemorrhage. And so, that is a corneal ectopic pregnancy, a surgical emergency with clear intraperitoneal hemorrhage. Our next case is one that should be familiar to everyone. It's an ovarian torsion. There is a large hypodense posterior pelvic mass. This is a fairly common location uh, these tend to drop back into the cul-de-sac when the ovary enlarges. I think the critical diagnostic finding here is the peripheral hypodensities that represent follicles displaced to the outer margins of the ovary by stromal edema. And there it is in the cul-de-sac. Note those peripheral hypodensities, which really let you go right to the diagnosis. There's very little that will have that appearance. And so that is an ovarian torsion. Our next case is an aortic aneurysm rupture into the IVC. I'm sure everyone knows there are four compartments into which an aortic aneurysm can rupture. The intraperitoneal, retroperitoneal, into the third portion of the duodenum, frequently following a surgical aortic repair, and lastly, into the adjacent IVC. And that's what we have here, probably the least common of all aortic ruptures. This one presents with arterialization of the venous system. So you can see that markedly dilated IVC and retrograde flow extending from it out into the hepatic veins. At the next level, we see that same phenomenon here, a dilated IVC, this time receiving retrograde, or actually giving off, retrograde flow into the left renal vein, the site where we should be seeing the earliest of venous return. Here we see the source of all the problems, a large abdominal aortic aneurysm, and the communication between it and the adjacent IVC that has resulted in this arterialization. Inferiorly, we can also see retrograde venous flow extending out here into the iliac veins. So we can appreciate that hepatic venous backflow. Left renal venous backflow, and throughout, note the distension of the IVC. Here is that abdominal aortic aneurysm with its aberrant connection and last retrograde flow extending distally in the IVC. As uncommon as these are, uh, most series have very few numbers in them, but 
somewhat surprisingly, the survival of this type of aortic aneurysm rupture is actually significantly better than those into other compartments. Here it is on 3D. There is the hepatic venous backflow, the aneurysm, and the communication between the aneurysm and IVC. You can really appreciate it here on the rotating images. So that is an aortic aneurysm rupture into the adjacent inferior vena cava. Our next case is of infectious sacroiliitis with associated septic thrombophlebitis. The most important finding in this case is this semilunar hypodense fluid collection on the deep aspect of the iliacus muscle lying just on the lateral aspect of the anterior sacroiliac joint. That, to my ex in my experience, is pathognomonic for infectious sacroiliitis. That's where the fluid from an infected sacroiliac joint collects, and I will call that infectious sacroiliitis, as I did in this case, even without bone window findings. Also present here is a filling defect in the posterior division of the internal iliac vein, which in this setting is consistent with septic thrombophlebitis. On the inferior aspect of the sacroiliac joint, there is also soft tissue swelling and a fluid collection extending into the external rotator musculature of the hip. Lastly, in a follow-up scan the next day, this patient demonstrated numerous cavitary lesions in a peripheral distribution, highly suggestive, especially in this setting, of septic emboli. So let's first appreciate the soft tissue windows. Here are the filling defect in the posterior division of the internal iliac vein. And here, the fluid collection deep to the iliacus muscle. Then on the inferior aspect of the SI joint, another fluid collection. Let's now appreciate the extent of the septic emboli that this patient had as a result. It will surprise no one, I'm sure, to learn that this was an intravenous drug user. And so, that is a case of infectious sacroiliitis with septic thrombophlebitis. Note again that fluid collection deep to the iliacus muscle is the critical finding here. And that brings us to the final case in this entire series. This is a case of meningococcal sepsis, or waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome. This case, as most of them do, begins with a pneumonia manifesting here as a right lower lobe consolidation. The next cut down, you can see manifestations of hypoperfusion and possibly uh, resuscitation, manifesting here as a flattened IVC and periportal hepatic edema. Perhaps the diagnostically most important finding is that of a splenectomy. Of course, splenectomized patients have an increased risk of infection by encapsulated organisms. Lower down, you can see again that flattened IVC, the periportal edema, and markedly hypodense kidneys related to hypoperfusion. You can also see Increased density within the adrenals plus periadrenal stranding, most likely representing underperfusion, enhancement, or possibly intraparenchymal hemorrhage, as is frequently uh, described with Waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome. Farther down still, you can see again the flattened IVC and the markedly underperfused kidneys. On the CINE, you can see again the right lower lobe consolidation and IVC flattening. There are the periportal edema and splenectomy and the hyperdense adrenal glands. And lastly, the markedly hypodense kidneys, again related to hypoperfusion. So this was accurately called by our radiologist, the 
emergency room was shut down, all the involved parties were prophylaxed, and the outcome was as good as it can be with a, an infection of this severity. Well, that concludes our entire series on thoracoabdominal emergencies. I'm Dr. Benjamin Strong. Thank you very much for watching.